and welcome back, welcome back to Shout. This is Jonathan here, and we have been having a great two days with you so far. Thanks for being here. The next session is going to go into the virtual world and, and, and look at the relationship between culture and the environment in a, a very special, unique way. And our guides for that are going to be Emily Key and Melissa Carrillo, who are sitting with me here um, at the Smithsonian. We're at the Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies today. And Emily and Melissa uh, work at the Smithsonian Latino Center. We'll be introducing them in just a moment. I wanted to thank our partners, the Smithsonian uh, Microsoft Partners in Learning and Taking It Global for uh, convening the Shout Online Conference Series. Um, just a quick note for those of you joining us for the first time or the first time today, Shout is punctuated by these great live online events, but Shout is much more than that. And there are many ways to stay connected with all of the activities and ways to learn and to take action around the issues that are important to you around the environment. One way to know about all of those things and what's coming up next is to follow us on Facebook. So like us there at Shout Learning. You can also find us on Twitter with the same name, Shout Learning. And if you're sharing information uh, that you're learning, your reflections, your takeaways, ideas for lessons or projects that you might do with your colleagues or friends or classmates, um, use the Shout Learn hashtag, Shout Learning hashtag to uh, keep us in the loop about what you're up to. So use that. And um, if you're involved in Pinterest, uh, a relatively new social media site, you might enjoy following us there as well, where we have uh, an online curation of Shout-related resources that we know you'd enjoy. Excellent. Well, we are very happy to have uh, with us um, two special guests. Uh, I'm, by the way, at the end of our session today, I'm going to come back and uh, tell you a little bit more about the Smithsonian Learning Quest, which is another way to go deeper and engage with Shout content. So my colleagues will remind me, we'll, we'll kind of just whet people's appetite on that for a moment. Okay, um, if you are new, by the way, to our session here, do introduce yourselves in the chat box. We'd love to get to know you a little bit. That's over on the left side of the screen. And I'm going to go ahead now and turn to the Education's Programs Manager and the Director of New Media and Technology at the Smithsonian Latino Center, Emily Key and Melissa Carrillo. Welcome. Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. My name is Emily Key. I am the Education Programs Manager for the Smithsonian Latino Center. And the work I do involves making sure that Latino culture is seen across all of the museums at the Smithsonian by leading programs that excite learning. So one of the things that I do is work very closely with a colleague of mine, Melissa Carrillo, to develop new media and technology educational tools. Hopefully you like learning, as in my job, I am lucky to be able to spend most of my time learning about many different cultures and people and then sharing them with audience members such as yourself. So we're going to get started in today's adventure, and our learning adventure today is going to revolve around Mi Tierra, Mi Mundo. So without further ado, I'll introduce you to my partner in crime at the Latino Center, Melissa Carrillo. Thank you, Emily. Wow, partner in crime. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Melissa Carrillo. I am the Director of New Media and Technology for the Smithsonian Latino Center. Uh, the work that I do focuses on some seriously amazing ways to engage and excite new ways of learning uh, online uh, using gaming simulations and virtual worlds. Emily and I want to share with you uh, a role-playing adventure quest game that we've been working on uh, lately called Mi Tierra, Mi Mundo, as you've heard, My Land, My World. So before we get started, we want to show you that uh, clip uh, to give you an idea what the game is about, and then we'll discuss it a little bit more uh, after we play the clip. Jonathan or Adam, please. LVM Eco Explorer Backpack and take a journey from snow-capped mountains, through the rainforest, down the river, and to the depths of the ocean, all the while exploring nature, people, cultures, and their interactions. Do you like to discover and collect artifacts while learning how we impact our environment and how we can help preserve it? Smithsonian LVM Eco Explorers are always on an adventure, so join us in Mi Tierra, Mi Mundo, My Land, My World. See you there!
Can anybody guess whose voice that was in the that was narrating the video? I'd just like to give out a big shout out to my colleague Emily Key because she was trying to be like Dora the Explorer, and I think she did a successful job of it. Let's not focus on the fact that I sound like Dora the Explorer, and instead let's focus a little bit on Mi Tierra Mi Mundo. So let's test your knowledge. After that minute clip, what is Mi Tierra Mi Mundo, My Land, My World, all about? Let's do a poll. There are four options. Let's remember the question, what is Mi Tierra Mi Mundo all about? A, culture and the environment. B, about water quality. C, science and you or D, all of the above? Answers, any answers? If you answered, if you answer D, you are now ready to become a Smithsonian Eco Explorer. So let, let's get started. Melissa? Okay. So before you start your game adventure, you may want to learn a little bit about how to move and explore your new environment. When you have time, please check out our interactivity guide. Uh, that will be basically give you some tips on how to navigate the space as well as give you some background information to the species and the habitats you will be encountering in the game. And Jonathan and Adam, if you don't mind uh, actually posting that resource link for our audiences in the chat. And while they do that, Emily, aside from the interactive Google Maps and videos in the book, uh, what favorites do you recommend? Well, something that I found very interesting, and uh, I should note that Melissa really is the person who's in-depth in this, and so I get a, a chance to experience things that are brand new, and one of those brand new things was 3D models. I had uh, never really heard of 3D models until, until I started working on this project and found that it's a great teaching tool and it's a great way to learn. It's almost as if you're right there. So let's talk a little bit about those 3D models. So the screen that you see up right now is an example of a 3D model, and it's actually a representation of the Maryland blue crab. So th this, actually, this 3D model, means that you can actually move it around by rotating it 360 degrees to see every view of the crab. Okay, so just as if you were holding it in your hands. Now, just bear in mind that this is a screenshot. You can't actually do that right now. But you should go onto the interactive activity guide and pick up the 3D model because it is a really cool experience. Let me tell you, I spent something like five minutes just playing with the Maryland blue crab. Um, Emily's been a wonderful guinea pig, by the way. I always turn around and show her after we make the stop. What do you think about this? Do you think the kids love it? So the Maryland blue crab is also known as the Atlantic blue crab. We call it the Maryland blue crab here in our neck of the woods, but most people know it as the Atlantic blue crab. Um, the blue crab is one member of the crab family. Did you know that crabs only swim and walk from side to side rather than forward or backward? Can you imagine walking side to side? Let's do a poll. Adam or Jonathan? I'm really liking these polls, by the way. <laughs> I want to figure tell. out how to do that in real life. <laughs> um, why do you think crabs have pinchers? Think about what pinchers are before you answer the question. There are five options. Option A, for eating pizza although pizza is a really important food source. Yum. Option B, for defending themselves. Option C, for picking up stuff. Option D, none of the above. Or option E, B and C. Okay. By the way, all the credit for that song goes to Jeopardy. <laughs> um, if you answered B and C, you are correct. Um, and you are now ready for the next Jeopardy round. Melissa? Okay, that was a lot of fun now, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so from, aside from using your interactivity guide, uh, you can also prepare yourself uh, for gameplay by watching some of our animation videos highlighting the species in the game. The videos illustrate some basic movements for each of the animals. So we're going to show you a short clip uh, of the polluted world uh, that our Smithsonian Equal Explorers actually uh, take on when they play Mi Tierra Mi Mundo Challenge. Now keep an eye out for some very interesting things, and we'll discuss that after the clip. Adam? <laughs>
by oh. the way. My team had a lot of fun making that uh, video clip, and we actually did a little editing even up until yesterday. So we really had a blast doing that. I hope you enjoyed watching that. So in the idea of keeping this presentation like a conversation, what do you think was going on in that video clip? Feel free to type in your thoughts in the chat box. What were some things that you saw? What kinds of animals did you see? And then we're going to ask a quick question about what you think happened to one of those animals. So if you can take a little bit, just a quick minute or so, to write down what you think you saw in this video clip. We have a giant crab, um, our guest from Indiana. Uh, there is a giant crab. Uh, anybody notice what was going on with the giant crab? A huge crab. <laughs> I think the crab grabbed everybody's attention. There was also an owl. There were. Uh, would, would you say it was a mutant crab? It appeared someone was running or searching a town. I saw a crab, a turtle, a green crab. Um, there is someone running and searching the town. That is actually our Smithsonian Eco Explorer. So when you play this game, um, that person will be you. It's your avatar, a uh, representation of yourself in this game. Um, and that person, the avatar, uh, the Eco Explorer is running around this town trying to figure out something. Do you think that this uh, town, the city, is it uh, a normal city? Does it appear normal what, from the small video clip you saw? A fire, a tornado? So I'm seeing it looked like a destroyed city, polluted water. So I'm seeing a, a common theme of there seem to be a lot of interesting things going on that were maybe out of the normal. There was definitely polluted water. It appears to be abandoned. There was fire. So part of the Eco Explorer game is trying to figure out what happened. What is it that happened to the city? And so it's a step process. There are different phases. And you're trying to figure out what happened to each one of these characters in the Eco Explorer game that will tell you a little bit about what happened to the city. So each character, as you encounter them in this game, explains a little bit about what's going on to the city. So we're going to do a poll, um, because I like polls. Uh, Apparently. I'm, I'm a big fan of polls. Uh, so we're going to try another poll. And this time, since the crabs seem to be so uh, very interesting, we're going to try to figure out a question. Which of these animals do you think was most affected by the environmental changes? Now note, everybody mentioned one animal, but all of these animals did appear in the clip. Number one, the opossum. Number two, the silver bass. Number three, the osprey. Number four, the owl. Number five, the diamondback terrapin, which by the way is also the Maryland, uh, University of Maryland terrapin mascot. The white-tailed deer. Number seven, the mallard. Or number eight, the Maryland blue crab. Wow, look at the numbers for the Maryland blue crab. I think people are very, very keen on the blue crab. Let's give it a couple more seconds to have everybody that's online sort of give their opinion as to which of all of them had the most effective changes. Emily, yes. Jacqueline, actually from Silver Spring, asks, are these regional species? Um, we're going to talk actually a little bit about where these species and where this environment is inspired from in just a little bit. And actually, uh, my but colleague Melissa question. will be talking about it. But you are correct in that it is a, focused on a specific region. And we are using this region as an example to talk about uh, the watershed. If you answered number eight, the Maryland blue crab, you are correct. Yay. The blue crab undergoes an amazing transformation during the video and also during the game. You will have to play the game to find out what happened to the mutant crab, but let's just say it experienced some major environmental changes, including changes in water quality. Aren't you looking forward to playing this game now? I know I am. Um, the pressure, oh my goodness. I know, such pressure. Now when I go play this game, I, I better know what I'm doing. In the chat <laughs> box, tell us what kinds of things you think affect the quality of the environment. So we've been talking a lot about the environment and environmental changes, but what do you think happens that affects the quality of the environment? What kinds of actions? Thinking back to what we were talking about while you populate the chat box with um, your answers to that question, 
thinking back to what we first introduced the game, um, this game is about the uh, combination and the um, sort of coordination between the human impact and the environment. So what things are we doing? Uh, when we say human activity, like Marlene from North Carolina, what human activity are we talking about that could possibly be affecting the environment? Invasive species? Um, a better question might be, what doesn't affect the environment? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Many, many things affect the environment. Um, human activity is one of them. Releasing waste to land, air and water. That is correct as well. Thank you, Anna. Um, in terms of human activity, pollution, what are we talking about? Pollution in terms of when you walk down the street and you put out your cigarette and you put it out on the street, is that human activity? Um, are we talking about that kind of uh, environmental pollution? Or are we talking about, um, from the previous session, if you were here in the previous session, um, the fog, fats, oils, and greases, and that going down your uh, tube, uh, your drain in the kitchen, and that affected the environment. Emily, do you think that that's what happened to our Maryland blue crab in the game? It could very <laughs> well be that fog affected that. I am telling you, I'm never going to see fats, oil, and greases in the same way ever again after this session. Um, <laughs> traffic, waste, pollution, all these things affect the environment. And all of these things that you're talking about, such as pollution or traffic or fog, affect the watershed. So we've been talking a lot about a watershed. What is a watershed? Anyone? Anyone? Answer watershed. We have a pop-up note that hopefully might guide you. Adam? Jonathan? No, no pop-up note. Oh, OK. Oh, OK. That's fine. We don't need the pop-up note. We can talk about what a watershed is. A watershed is where we are currently, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. But a watershed is also an environment that is surrounded um, by some open water source. So for instance, in the Chesapeake Bay, and look, if you look at the PowerPoint, it's actually an animated PowerPoint. The current slide, yeah, you can see you the can water see cycle the, is, an, is animated. You can see the rainfall coming down. You can see upstream, such as what Gail from the previous session was talking about, water flowing downwards. You see it falling down from the, uh, the sky through rainwater, going down, going th down through the um, basin and ending up as groundwater and underground rivers. The pop-up has just appeared. A watershed is an area or land basin from which water ultimately drains into a major river, which then dumps into the ocean or sea. So as you can see, when you're driving, um, when you are cleaning up in your kitchen and throwing fats, oils, or greases down the drain, when you have invasive species, when you have human activity and pollution, when you have fertilizers, all these things affect the different parts of the water cycle and ultimately affect your watershed. Um, so that is an overall what is a watershed. And so what you can see is that everybody has a watershed. Your neighborhood, whether you're in Washington, D.C., North Carolina, Aurora, Colorado, um, Mobile, Alabama, we all have watersheds. Melissa? Thank you, Emily. All right, so this kind of goes back to um, Jacqueline's question, actually. So for right now, uh, if you can look up on your screen, check out these two sketches closely. Um, we worked with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, to illustrate the ecosystem and their immediate environment. This really helped me and my team accurately represent in the game the basic core concepts of uh, what a watershed is, and in particular, what the main habitats in the area of Cirque part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, what exactly those were. Uh, so if, if you can notice, uh, there are six uh, highlighted uh, habitats that we worked with. Uh, you see the sandy beaches, or apparently Emily told me earlier she would love to be at right now, sipping on a, I don't know, pina colada or something. Uh, piers, rocks, and jetties, oyster reefs, seagrass, shallow waters, and intertidal flats and wetlands. So you can see by that sketch alone the uh, species that are conducive to each one of those habitats. And how, and if you look at, at the sketch above, uh, how we use that as our, our, our blueprint or baseline for how we were going to recreate this type of um, 
representation within the game. It's a little slightly different when you see it later on in a couple of slides down what the actual environment looks like, but this was our blueprint. This is what we really had to nail down uh, with um, CERC, Smithsonian Environmental Research, in terms of making sure that we accurately represented what a watershed was. One of the interesting things is you can see six different kinds of habitats, and all of these habitats are found in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So there can be many different habitats within one watershed. So if you take a look at your own watershed, you could possibly find some of these same sim sim right. or similar habitats in your own watershed. So Sandy Beaches, for instance, is where the blue crab lives. And we've been talking a lot about the crab. Um, the Sandy Beach is where the crab lives. Um, but if you've ever been to a wetland, um, sorry, if you're in Florida, for instance, and you go to the Everglades, those are intertidal wetlands. Um, and they're a combination of shoreline and tall grass. And you have many different kinds of species that live there, um, birds and uh, species that are uh, low water uh, species. The opossum, for instance, in the Chesapeake Bay lives there. So this is an interesting activity to do with your students or with your classroom or um, on your own at home is to take a look at your own watershed and see what kinds of habitats there might be in your own watershed. And Emily, can I point out, and in the game, I mean, you, you made the comment that the Maryland blue crab's habitat is sandy beaches. So in the game, obviously something happens to the Maryland blue crab. So through your avatar, you have to conduct a, a number of different types of missions, and one of them is actually water quality testing, so that you can figure out what actually happened to the Maryland blue crab. Um, Jacqueline actually just uh, posted a question. So watersheds are host to habitats for various species. That is correct. They are. Watersheds host humans and human activity, but they also host animals um, such as white-tailed deer for the Chesapeake Bay, going back to our example, um, all the way to the blue crab. And all of that is in the same watershed. So you have very different species interacting in the same environment, which is why each species impacts that environment. Human activity, what we do, um, driving down the road, um, impacts how um, the white-tailed deer interacts. And so it is all a chain of how each, imp each species impacts the other species and how all of us impact the watershed as a whole. So back to my uh, question and prompt. I was prompted by Melissa that I, I forgot <laughs> to ask a question. Um, Just reminding you. So now I've been re reminded in the chat box, um, Adam or Jonathan, if you could uh, list the, the uh, five uh, spe uh, habitats, shallow waters, sandy beaches, oyster reefs, wetlands, or piers, rocks, and jetties. These are five habitats. Take a list, look at the list, and then after um, knowing what you now know about uh, what Melissa and I have talked about of the six habitats, which is the habitat that is missing? Um, there is a habitat that is missing because we've been focusing on six that are here in the Chesapeake Bay. Take a look and see if you can find the one that's missing. Take a look at the PowerPoint as a clue or as a hint. Nancy oh, Green, Nancy. She, you are our winner. You're our oh, first. We have another one. We have another one. Seagrass, you are correct. Seagrass is the one that is missing. And here in the Chesapeake Bay, one of the species that is um, calls seagrass their home is the eel. Um, and quite an interesting species for sure. And if you go and visit the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center or look at their website, you can find more information specifically about that species as well as all the species that are listed in this slide. Well, thanks, Emily. That was a lot of fun. OK, so now that we've learned a little bit about what a watershed is and we have a little bit more of an idea of, especially with the Chesapeake Bay in terms of habitats and, and the types of species you would find in this watershed, um, here's an, an example of an activity uh, in the game where you would get a chance to, pra to practice your camera settings to locate specific locations, objects, species, and characters throughout your Eco Explorer adventure. Um, and as you can see, the idea is to really focus on the skill qualities of observation. So in the game itself, in the first mission, your avatar is actually asked to survey the virtual environment. And in doing that, you're prompted to actually 
figure out, well, I mean, you're, you're given very specific instructions, but you get to uh, basically understand how to use the tools uh, in the game at the very beginning. So you'd learn how to use very specific camera settings. Like we have a really cool uh, tools, for example, a zoom feature that allows you to really zoom in and out and really look at details. And uh, you get to use a telescope up in the observation deck. Uh, and again, all of these things are really connected to the actual gameplay and, and the actual mission uh, that's tasked for, for each quest. Thank you, Emily. She's actually changing the slide for me. So what you see here now is actually the map prototype that actually lays out the actual adventure quest, starting from the base camp up in the upper right-hand corner. Now, I don't know if you can see that. I don't know if Adam or Jonathan with their cursor can actually just point that out up at the top and the upper right-hand corner base camp. Actually, that's actually where the first mission occurs. There are actually eight quests. This is a, a one-level game. So there's eight quests, and you start up in the mountains on the base camp, and you make your way through uh, the different uh, locations. And as you can see, you start up in the mountains to the hills, down to the forest, the lake, the marsh. Uh, there's activities down by the beach, by the boardwalk. We talked about the sandy beaches. Again, that's where you might encounter the Maryland blue crab, mm -hmm. mutant <laughs> style. Who knows? You'll have to play the game to figure it out. Then you go up through the mud flats. Um, you might encounter an osprey or two. Uh, and then there's some activity going up through the cornfields. You will meet our Senor Chavez, who is our organic farmer. You will have conversations with him. He'll give you very specific uh, information to get you to the next level. And then it takes you through the aqueducts and up through the hills again and through some uh, ruins. Uh, and that's actually where the next level of the game would begin. But you have to complete all eight, all eight quests. So this just kind of gives you an idea of how we're laying out the game. This isn't actually the final uh, map version, but it gives you kind of a good idea. Quick question uh, that has come in. Is the game bilingual? That's an excellent question. Oh my goodness. Yes, it is bilingual. So it's a, a fantastic way of learning Spanish or English. Uh, it, and you actually have a choice at the beginning of your language, hmm. um, your language choice uh, from the very inset of the game, uh, the characters that you choose, the characters that you run into, so you can actually be switching languages. Cameron from Hoover, Alabama has a question. Does the game work on mobile devices? Excellent. Yes, it will. Because again, the game will be released by September 1st of this year, actually. So yes, it will be. And we're actually using a technology called Unity 3D, which is very conducive to allowing us to create content that is cross-platform, which really allows us to to reach more audiences. And as you pointed out, Cameron, uh, mobile devices is a big, big deal. That's great. There's also a question uh, in terms of the how long the game would take to play to complete level one, for example. Well, you know, that's a, a great question because we've been going th ongoing evaluation and assessment as we're producing this and we're in focus groups and et cetera, et cetera. And it's up to the player. We, we thought about putting in certain timed uh, elements but a lot of the feedback we were getting, the majority of folks really preferred to have time to even go and explore the environment on their own rather than having to hurry up and go to the next area to find the next clue. You know, like what's the game on TV uh, where uh, you are the first team to arrive? That kind of time thing? No, we're, so we're not doing that kind of thing. Yeah, what is it? Amazing. amazing race, that's it. This is not an amazing race kind of thing. It's It allows you to really um, explore your surroundings and, and kind of become familiar with the characters and, and kind of really understand some of the core concepts that are being uh, introduced. Um. One of the big things for the educators or other people that are interested in this kind of um, uh, educational tool is that it is at the core an education game. So you are building skill sets. It is about uh, scientific method and inquiry and learning about the scientific process. It's also about learning about what a watershed is. And it gives you ideas as to tools that you can use to help uh, conserve your watershed. So throughout the game, you are hearing through avatars from uh, science 
science scientists and other experts, environmental experts, tell you about core ideas of environmental quality and environmental preservation. And those are ideas that you can take to your real community from this virtual game. You can take it to your real community and apply it in your real home area, in your real community. And the idea behind that is uh, twofold with the game. Yes, you are teaching scientific skills and scientific inquiry, but you're also allowing people to gain information through this new technology about how they can conserve their own environment um, and allow them to be citizen scientists in their own community. Uh, Emily and Melissa, there's a question about whether the game is a, a massive multiplayer game. Are people playing it in, in real time with other people, uh, or are they engaging with the game directly on their own time? You know, Jonathan, I'm looking at all the questions. I'm going, wow, these are fantastic. Everybody should be part of our focus group. Uh, um, <laughs> in a way, they a, are. <laughs> yeah, it, they are. And this, that's an excellent question. Uh, this uh, particular uh, game that we're talking about right now, this prototype, will be released first as a standalone game and then we will re-release it as a multi-user virtual world game. A again, using uh, Unity 3D. So first it'll be a standalone game, again, accessible through mobile devices as well, and then we will uh, release it as a multi-user virtual world, or a move, as they call it. Thanks. And I'm just going to interject and say, for those of you that are not necessarily familiar with this technology, um, I was not familiar with this technology when I first started um, with this project, and I have to tell you, it is quite the experience, and once you get used to uh, the environment, you never want to leave. I spent something like the last week before the Christmas vacation um, basically playing this game over and over again, and I think my boss was wondering what I was doing. Um, yeah, she became a little too involved with the opossum and trying to figure out how to get him out of the underground tunnels. <laughs> but it, it is, I say that to say that it is a great experience for you educators or parents out there to engage your uh, young children, your teenagers in this kind of activity. And it really becomes an activity that grabs you and that grabs your attention uh, for periods of time. So I think it's a great way to start that kind of discussion about environmental quality and conservation and your impact. When, when you get kind of get pulled in and, and hooked into the game, what do you think is most, uh, uh, is most keeping you there? What, what is it about the experience for you I, personally? For me personally, I want to find out why these why, why this is happening. I, I want to find out how I can help these characters. It's almost like the, the species, and, and maybe I'm just way too involved with the species, but like I said before, I'm sort of the uh, the test pilot and I'm the educator, but I, I am, Melissa's usually the one who's really in the weeds with this project. So when I come in, I'm just grabbed by the environment and the species, and I, I take these characters and they become my friends, and I want to help them out because they're Tell stuck. Tell us more, Emily. Oh my so, goodness. Um, I think I'm, I'm trying to solve, I, I feel like I'm trying to solve a, a problem, and I'm, I, once you are presented with a problem, I'm the type of person who wants to figure out how to solve that problem. I can't just walk away, which clearly becomes then a week-long project where, you know, I'm doing my own little sideshow over there. But it is a great opportunity to engage, um, you know, learners of all ages. Um, you so, know. Emily, let me ask you, so you're saying then, too, that the technology itself, um, the immersiveness of the graphics, the fact mm -hmm. that you have an avatar, are vehicles that really pull you in even further. Exactly, and I think the avatar, the avatar concept was new to me um, until I really started working with Melissa, and I, I'm not a follower of video games. Um, I just recently bought an Xbox, and apparently I'm, you know, slow on the uptake on that. Um, and so I pulled her into Second Life kicking and screaming, but so we, we I did wasn't, some great stuff. I wasn't big on avatars, um, but really the ability to design your own uh, person, your own character, it's it almost allows you to take on a second life, which is, I know, funny, but since I'm we're in second life, but it takes allows you to take on a second life and, and be a, a different person and do role playing, and so when you go into the game, it's no longer you, it's your, your alter ego kind of thing, and um, I now understand why people like video games, yeah. um, because it really is a great way to teach. I'm um, curious to hear from uh, folks who are on with us today, if, if you do play video games, what is it about the games that you enjoy that engage you, that pull you in? Do, does what Emily said resonate with you? Is it the, is it the problem solving, the real life uh, uh, challenge that's presented to you? Uh, is it the immersive nature of the environment, the graphics? Go ahead and let us know. Um, to answer uh, 
Leah's question from Aurora, Colorado. What ages is the game geared towards? Um, I will Great question. defer that to we Melissa. We haven't answered that yet. Actually, this is uh, targeted to middle school, which we're looking at sixth through eighth graders. But then again, I'm not in middle school and I enjoy this game. So I think it exactly. really is learners right, of all ages. Right. Um, and like I was mentioning before, um, that yes, it, it is teaching uh, the scientific method and scientific process. One of the first things that this game teaches is the first couple of steps in the scientific process method and the scientific process, which is first you make a hypothesis or an educated guess as to what's going on. So we did that just a few moments ago when we asked you to tell us what you thought what was going on with the world with the 60 second video clip that you saw and, and you told us what you thought. Um, and then the next step is observation. And so let's focus a quick minute on the importance of observation in the process of scientific inquiry. And this is one way you might be able to teach the scientific method to um, your students. Um, the first step, obviously, making the hypothesis or educated guess. And the second step, making an observation. So in the chat box, using the current uh, slide that you see, which is a screenshot of the actual world. This is what the environment will look like um, in the game that Melissa just showed us the layout. This is what the environment will look like. Uh, take a moment to look at the environment and point out some features um, that you see in this environment. Um, you can also, um, you know, point out some of the things that uh, the arrows and, the, and the, the lines are showing us. These are all aspects of the environment and what we're going to be doing as part of this activity is having students, having the audience, um, the player, engage in this kind of observation. Just like scientists and environmental researchers engage in this kind of observation in their areas. Um, Jacqueline has a question, are these game environments based on real life locations? Uh, yes, they are based on real life locations. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we partnered with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And so our watershed is modeled off of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is the watershed that is closest to the Smithsonian home here in uh, Maryland, DC, and Virginia. Um, but like we said, this is just a model of our watershed so that we can talk about watersheds in general. And how we impact. And can I point out, Emily, because I don't think we actually said this uh, up front, that in the immersive activity guide that we talked a little bit about early on, uh, all of this is actually based on national standards. So it's again, those standards are reinterpreted within gameplay itself. We have Michael from Arlington stating that it, the location looks like some kind of temple in the background with some kind of ranger-like station. And so this is a screenshot, and I'm going to um, actually refer to Melissa, of one of the areas that are covered in uh, Mi Tierra Mi Mundo. And Melissa, maybe you can explain to us a little bit about what we're looking at here. If you remember in, in previous slide, uh, I mentioned that the first quest, the first mission actually takes place uh, in the upper portion of the uh, right hand side of the mountain there uh, where you will actually uh, where your avatar is actually prompted to look for uh, a tower like uh, object which you pointed out already which is great uh, I think that was Michael that pointed out yeah and that's actually where you will actually uh, it has an observation deck so you will you as your avatar will go through there and you'll kind of be able to use the camera view and, and kind of scan the whole environment um, the ruins on the other side, um, those are fictional. We had to put that in there because that's kind of, uh, again, a way to take the player to the next level. And there's uh, some very uh, specific uh, activities even within that uh, area where you actually have to decipher some hieroglyphics of the species that you already encountered throughout the uh, entire watershed. And if you unlock it, you get to unlock the, the temple of the sun or the, the portal and that takes you to the next level. So yeah, that was great that you pointed that out because I wasn't sure everybody would be able to see that from the screenshot. One of the um, things or activities that you might want to do before with your students or with your uh, uh, children before you uh, start the gameplay is have them do a little bit of observation in their local area. Um, for instance, you can ask them to observe their environment that they're in. So take them around a walk of your neighborhood and have them sort of jot down or tell you what kinds of things they see in their environment. For instance, if they have a river 
or if you have trees or if you live in a city or in, if you encounter wildlife because all these tools of observation are one used in scientific method but two are also used throughout the game and it will be very important for them to continue observing throughout the game in order to be able to uh, finish up the game quests and make it through to the end. Um, and that is, again, a key part of what scientists do, which is observing environmental changes like the ones we've seen throughout Mi Tierra Mi Mundo. Jacqueline asked the great question, is the god of rain based on cultural mythology? Actually, yes, Jacqueline, we're, again, a little bit of this might change in the final product. Uh, we were trying to see how we could infuse different cultural aspects up front in the game, in the actual game panel, in the tool set. And so by infusing very specific design motifs uh, that were cultural references to, say, Aztec mythology or Mayan mythology, that that would, you know, uh, be ways of infusing uh, certain cultural elements. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Who did that? Adam? That's magic. Um, Nancy asks a question, does the player get to create an avatar? In this first prototype, okay, bear with us because it's a prototype, uh, you will have the option of a male or female avatar. Uh, as we uh, take it to the next level, obviously, yes, we will have different, different uh, characters that you can either choose or that you create yourself. And that will be a, a more of a, an advantage in the multi-user virtual world uh, option. And since we are nearing the end of our time, Melissa and I first wanted to thank you for coming. And then since you did come to our session, uh, Melissa is going to give you a little preview of what's to come. Thanks, Em. And thank you, everybody, as well. Uh, you've had some wonderful questions uh, asking throughout uh, our presentation. Uh, what you see here uh, is an example of one of the uh, animal guides that we'll be using in the game. And you know, feel free later on to shoot us any feedback. Uh, but we wanted to leave you with a teaser uh, and also to kind of showcase uh, Olivier Careval, one of our Smithsonian folklorists, who actually was gracious enough to uh, allow us to record her. Uh, and she's representing the owl. So if Jonathan or Adam can play that video for us. Life-giving, life-sustaining, precious, water cycling through all its forms, solid, liquid, vapor. The watershed itself, a delicate cycling balance between Earth and sky, has been in perpetual motion on planet Earth for four billion years. Each species relies on the watershed cycle for its existence, including Homo sapiens, humans. Long ago, the planet faced an eco-disaster but our ancient ancestors worked with other species and used the knowledge of the earth to save the environment. But now, humans are ignoring the wisdom of the ancestors and are endangering the very watershed needed to sustain their lives and those of other animals and plants on the planet. They have forgotten that we are all stewards of this magical planet and responsible for its care. But all is not lost. There's a group of humans who have banded together with other species to help save the environment from destruction. But they need your help. If you are willing to help the Earth, then pass through the portal and seek out the Smithsonian eco-scientists and other Earth-conscious citizens. They will help you with your quests. Remember to also ask the various animals in the watershed that you see. They have valuable insights from their eyes about the environment. And I will be there along the way as your spirit guide in all times as you quest, for you may need to seek the wisdom of the ancient ancestors as well. Go now and save our planet. Now what you just listened to, of course, is a prototype. Uh, we will be creating more uh, for the owl and kind of testing which, which voice lends itself. Uh, best to the character, uh, but I want to point out it will also be bilingual. And uh, thank you, Adam and Jonathan. They actually posted the link to the video. I really encourage you all to see the video because, I mean, it's pretty dramatic and we did a great job and we actually did our final edits yesterday and it came out really, really good. And so with that, we come to the end of our session, sadly, but we did want to we did want to tell you um, to please check out Mi Tierra Mi Mundo when it comes to um, an online site near you in uh, September 2012. 
Um, it is a great way to learn about the watershed, about the Chesapeake Bay, about um, role playing and culture and the environment and your role, and then ways in which you can help conserve your own watershed. Hopefully through the game quests you will learn different tools from Smithsonian scientists that will help you apply those tools to your own environment and allow you to be a responsible environmentally conscious citizen. Um, thank you so much for coming. We are more than welcome to answer any questions that you might have. Our emails are carrillom at si.edu, and then mine is k-e-y-e-k-e -E -E at si.edu. Uh, the Shout team also has our, our contact information, and uh, we'd like to give a shout out to Shout for allowing us to present shout this out to shout. Uh, presentation, and I think this really exciting new way to talk about the environment um, in a new media and technology setting. Thank you, Nancy, Cameron, Jacqueline, Rio, I see everybody typing in. Thank you so much. Jacqueline, to answer your question, uh, I think it just scrolled up. Yes, the uh, gods and goddesses do assist the avatar. Um, you just have to figure out how to get uh, the advice from them. So it's part of how, how do you figure out uh, interacting within the environment with the species and et cetera, et cetera. Um, thank you for pushing the boundaries of uh, what it means to engage uh, online and to connect with this topic. Uh, many of our, um, our colleagues and friends logged in from around the world joined us yesterday from CERC, which it sounds yes. like was right. the yep. uh, inspiration for, for, yes. the, uh, for the visual environment we see when we log into uh, Mi Tierra Mi Mundo. Uh, and here are some pictures just from yesterday, almost side by side here with your uh, a snapshot of your landscape. And there is a there is a connection there. Um, incidentally, there's some bugs uh, that we saw yesterday oh, yeah. out, out at oh, Cirque. Oh, fabulous! Uh, that's yeah. a nice looking one. Mm. Uh, kind of reminds me a little bit of the pinchers on your your crab. Um, um, it's also <laughs> a bit of a meditative environment out at Cirque. <laughs> that's there, yes. That is our field producer Adam, who uh, worked with uh, all of our presenters in preparing for the Shout Online Conference series, but. Um, but it, it's it's interesting. I'm I'm intrigued by what happens. I like the approach, and I echo what others have said about I'm um, starting with the um, uh, with a sort of a single user process, and then perhaps growing it into a multi-user game. Right. I think that's a a very smart uh, process. You're going to learn a lot from that. So um, thank you both so very much. I I did want to in, invite everybody to stick around for our final session, which will begin in about um, one hour and ten minutes. Um, and um, that session will feature um, uh, Catherine Christen, who's going to be talking about the history of water protection legislation and asking the question, which is, what has been the impact of legislation on water quality and what kinds of governmental actions are still needed? This is a question that has come up several times by many of you throughout the last two days, and so we're glad that we have somebody uh, expert who's on hand who's going to uh, be walking us through that. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, one of the great ways to stay connected with the Shout Project uh, is to um, connect with our Smithsonian Learning Quests. And if you're a teacher uh, or a parent uh, or you're a student, you can let your teacher or your parent know that they can visit the website um, at the bottom of the slide here and then engage more deeply uh, with Smithsonian resources and content. And by the way, on the Smithsonian Quests website, I'm very um, happy to point out that what we um, have done on that site, uh, once you become a member of the Smithsonian Quests site, you will find, if I jump over here, um, that all of the Shout uh, recordings uh, uh, will be available to you as part of that program so you can connect between them and all of these opportunities to earn badges and, and go deeper. So you've got all of our land-based uh, programs from last year and all of our water-based sessions. You'll see some familiar faces scrolling by. So uh, yet another reason uh, to join that site to have all of the Shout uh, conferences and, and deeper resources in one place. So do check that out and join us on the badging site. Um, by the way, Cameron says, I can't wait to get started. Uh, will we get some notification when it's live? If you need more student testers, uh, I can get you plenty. Any any thoughts for yes, Cameron? Yes, thank you for picking that up. Cameron, yes, you can email both uh, Emily and I, and we will definitely connect with you. We would love to have more student testers. The more the merrier. Excellent. So um, do uh, feel free to uh, to um, stay connected. We would love to see you again. And maybe we can do an update with you guys after the game uh, oh, uh, the game launches. We can get a, a real wide tour. Maybe people will be asking for clues at that point. Okay. Wonderful. 
the Emily will be their go-to person. On that. <laughs> yeah, there you uh, go. We have put a link to an evaluation at the top left corner of the screen. Uh, we hope you can join us for our third session today. But if this is your last session with us today live, please do click on that link and give us some feedback. But if you'll be back in an hour when we uh, we launch into our third and final shout session for today, um, you can complete the evaluation at the end of that. Uh, we'll go ahead and, if it's okay, we'll go ahead and share uh, an email contact yes, in the chat fine. so that's that fine. Cameron sure, no and problem. others can stay connected with all of you. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all soon. Don't forget to find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest as Shout Learning. Uh, we'll see you in just about an hour. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.